In this video, I'm going to describe some of my research on how people learn to recognize new patterns. Pattern learning is a critical part of many different kinds of cognitive processes, including learning a language for the first time. So to illustrate this, I'm going to play you a one minute clip of audio from an artificial language that you have never heard before. I want you to see if you can identify the words in this language. Okay. So here's a written representation of the language that you just heard. So the question is, where are the words in this language? For example, is dupabe a word or dupabi? What about bigoku? So one way that you might be able to figure out the words is by learning the statistical structure of the different syllables in the language. Which syllables reliably predict other syllables? And what are the patterns? In fact, that's really the only way to identify the words in this language because there are none of the pauses or changes in intonation that might be used as cues for word boundaries in real languages. If you listen to this language for long enough, then you would eventually notice that the syllables reliably occur in groups of three. Bigoku always occurs as a unit, as does Buladu, Tadupa, and Datiba. And we know from dozens of studies that humans can reliably learn this kind of statistical structure. In fact, we know that newborn infants can also learn this, suggesting that learning statistical patterns in the world is really a fundamental part of how our brain works. However, we don't yet know what the cognitive mechanisms that enable this kind of learning are, but there are many different ideas. So one idea is associative learning. And the idea with this is that we form subconscious associations between syllables that occur sequentially. For example, since B always comes before go, we build up a reliable association between B and go. A second idea is that we engage in a form of hypothesis testing. Perhaps we are testing different theories about what kind of patterns could generate the stream of syllables that we are hearing. Some people think that this hypothesis testing is explicit and deliberate, while others think it could be implicit and automatic. A third idea is that we use a kind of memory. So we have memories of lots of different combinations of syllables as a result of listening to the, to the uh, audio. Since B and go occurs more often than pairs of syllables that are not part of a word, we have more memories of B go and thus eventually learn to recognize it as a pattern. Deciding between these different models or theories is a really hard problem because we can't actually observe the learning itself as it happens in the brain. We simply just don't have the technology to allow us to do that kind of investigation. So instead, we have to track the result of the learning process. However, all of these theories predict that people will learn the statistical structure eventually. So it can be really difficult to figure out which theory is the best one. One thing that the theories do seem to make different predictions about is how learning will progress over time. For example, many versions of the associative learning theory predict that learning will be a smooth, gradual process, like the red curve. On the other hand, versions of the hypothesis testing and chunk-based memory theories predict a sudden change in learning as the learner discovers the right hypothesis or encodes the correct memory. So this would result in shapes more like the blue curve. So to measure this learning as it happened, we ran an experiment where participants had to type the letters they saw as quickly as possible. 
the goal is for the participant to type the letter in the gray box. It looks like my animation here might not be working. So imagine that these Y and A are sort of moving to the left and that new letters are appearing uh, inside the gray box periodically. So um, if the correct key is pressed by the participant, the box would turn green. If the incorrect key is pressed, the box turns red. What we don't tell participants is that there are patterns embedded in the sequences of letters that are going by. And if a participant learns these patterns, then they should be able to go faster on the task because they will be able to predict what the next letter is in the sequence. We tested three different kinds of patterns. In all three conditions, the sequence NIW appeared as a reliable pattern. In the known words condition, we also included three English words, day, her, and cut. In the novel words condition, we used those same three English words, but they appeared backwards. And in the scrambled words condition, we used the same letters, but they didn't appear in a reliable order. So the only pattern in this condition is the N, I, and W. In all three conditions, the appearance of an N is relatively unpredictable. So many different letters can occur before an N. I and W, however, are perfectly predictable. If you know the pattern and see an N, you know that an I will be next, followed by a W. And as people learn the patterns, we expect that their responses to I and W will get faster, but the responses to N will not. So in this experiment, we were interested in how the surrounding context whether it be known words, novel words, or scrambled words, would affect the learning of the NIW pattern, which is of course the same in all three of the conditions. So here are the main results. On the y-axis of these graphs, we are plotting response time in milliseconds. On the x-axis is the number of times that a participant has seen a letter before. In this experiment, they saw each letter 72 times, and I'm gonna call this variable time because it is very closely related to the amount of time that the participant has seen the sequence. The three panels are for the three characters of interest, N on the left, I in the middle, W on the right. The colors represent different conditions. Each dot represents the average for all participants for that particular letter in that particular condition at that particular time. One thing that's immediately apparent is that um, I and W are very different from N. So for N, all three conditions show the same kind of learning curve. It looks like the participants are getting a little bit faster at the N over time, but nowhere near the improvement that we saw for I and W, especially in the red and green conditions. Uh, to explain our statistical model of this data, I'm going to focus on just one of the nine different curves that we saw. So that's illustrated by the plot on the right, which is just a single curve. We modeled the response time at time t as being generated by a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. Since mu is the mean, you can think of mu as representing the trend line in the data, and sigma represents the dispersion of the data around the trend line. And if sigma were very small, then the points would all sit nicely on the line. To capture the shape of this curve over time, we used a power function with three parameters mu at time t is equal to this function. Alpha here represents the starting position of the curve at time one. Beta is a value between zero and one and represents the amount of learning that occurs relative to the starting position. If beta is zero, then no learning will occur because the equation will be equal to alpha for all values of t. If beta is equal to one, then the equation will asymptote at zero. This parameterization ensures that all predicted values are positive, which is important for the response time measurements, which cannot be negative, of course. Finally, uh, the gamma parameter controls the rate of learning. Larger values of gamma result in a steeper curve. We model alpha as being generated by a gamma distribution, uh, beta as being generated by a beta distribution, and gamma as being generated by a gamma distribution. Each of these distributions also has a set of parameters, and we put vague priors on these six parameters. And the vague priors reflect our knowledge about what kinds of values are reasonable to expect in this experiment. 
For example, we don't expect alpha to be more than 2,000 because the experiment continued to the next letter after 2,000 milliseconds. So it would be impossible for a response time to be greater than 2,000. Uh, finally, we put a gamma prior on sigma. So this is the full model for one of the nine lines that we saw in the results. To expand this model for all nine lines, we simply duplicate the model nine times. There are three letters, and each letter appeared in three different conditions, so we have nine different uh, distributions. Each of the mu's gets its own power function, so we have 27 total parameters, nine alphas, nine betas, and nine gammas, to describe the nine lines. And then to reflect the fact that we expect some similarity in performance across the different conditions, we assume that each of the nine beta values is generated from the same beta distribution. We do the same for alpha and gamma values, but I'm gonna leave those off the screen to avoid too much clutter. So why do we think there will be this similarity? Well, uh, everyone is learning the same basic kind of task using the same kind of interface. There's a lot in common across the conditions. And this kind of hierarchical model allows us to pool information about the typical response times for the task across the different conditions. All right, so back to the results. The lines that you see on the graphs are generated by sampling from the posterior distribution. So as you can see, the fits are pretty good. The lines are right in between all the data points. Um, and our original question here was about the shape of the learning process. Um, is it a sudden process? Is it a gradual process? And it looks like the learning process is in fact pretty smooth and gradual. So is this in fact evidence for theories like the associative learning theory? Well, no. Uh, there's a really big issue here. So the previous model looked at the average response time across subjects, but the mechanisms, the cognitive processes that we are interested in, in operate at the, um, at the level of the individual. So average learning curves might not reflect the individual learning curves. And to illustrate this, take a look at the graph on the right. The red line here is the average and looks relatively smooth and gradual, but the data being averaged are shown by the light gray lines. Notice that all of the light gray lines follow, um, involve a, a steady response time for some period of time, followed by a sudden drop. So these are anything but smooth and gradual. The shape of the individual lines is really the most important piece of information here because we're interested in the cognitive mechanisms that are operating at the level of the individual. So here's some individual level data from our experiment. And the red dots show the response time to the letter W, which is one of the predictable letters. And the blue dots show the response time to N, which is the unpredictable letter. And there are a couple different patterns here. So in the top row, we see two subjects who show similar patterns of responses to both the predictable and unpredictable letters throughout the experiment. In the middle row, we see two subjects who appear to show a sudden shift around the 40th appearance of the predictable letter. And in the bottom row, we see two subjects who show some differences between the predictable and unpredictable letters almost immediately. So our statistical model really needs to be able to capture all of these individual level patterns, as well as the tendencies at the group level. For example, we wanna know if individuals in the three different conditions, the known words, novel words, and scrambled words, tend to show differences in the amount of learning that they show. So to talk about the model, I'm gonna use some artificial data. Um, like before, time is on the x-axis and response time is on the y-axis. And here the unpredictable letter is in blue and the predictable letter is in red. Um, let's start by focusing on the unpredictable letter. So like before, we are going to model this with a power function using the same three parameters of alpha, beta, and gamma. The functional form here is really similar, or it's almost, I guess it's identical to what we saw before. The difference is that now we are fitting these parameters at the level of the individual. So we're for one particular letter that the individual saw. Even though we don't expect any learning of the statistical structure for this unpredictable element, we do expect that participants will get faster due to familiarization with the task. They get comfortable with the keyboard, the letters that they are typing, and sort of the, how the information is appearing on the screen. 
So this is a kind of learning, but it's not pattern learning. And we're going to call it adaptation to the task. Now the predictable element, the W, will also show the same kind of adaptation to the task. So we'll describe the shape of this curve with the same adaptation curve used for the unpredictable element. Notice that the beta and gamma parameters are identical, but alpha here is different. Alpha controls the starting point of the curve, sort of the overall speed of response to that letter. And since W and N are in different locations on the keyboard, we expect that there could be systematic differences in the response times to W and N without any sort of learning or adaptation effect. But beta and gamma are the same because we expect adaptation to be about the same for all letters. So with this particular model, we can use the adaptation to letter N to help us make inferences about whether there is any additional learning for the statistical structure. If the beta and gamma parameters for N can also describe W, then this individual probably didn't learn any statistical structure. They were just showing adaptation to the task. On the other hand, if the beta and gamma for the adaptation curve don't fit well, then we allow the model to classify the individual as a learner. This adds a few parameters to the red curve. So omega here is the onset of learning. It's the dashed vertical line. This is the point at which the adaptation curve no longer fits. After this point, we multiply the adaptation curve by another power function, which has two additional parameters, another beta and another gamma. But these are distinct from the adaptation beta and gamma. These are specific to the learning process. Beta learn is between zero and one and controls the amount of learning that the second uh, curve shows. And gamma controls the rate as before. So notice that the functional form of the adaptation and learning curves are very, very similar. The only difference is the omega parameter, which acts as an offset along the x-axis for the learning curve. This individual level model is then embedded into a hierarchical model. So each of the parameters that you see, alpha, beta, gamma for both kinds of curves, as well as omega and the probability that any individual will actually be classified as a learner and that they'll need the secondary curve. These are all connected to group level distributions that are specific to the experimental condition. So we can use this model to make inferences about both individuals and groups simultaneously. Here's a sample of subjects and model fits for individuals. The light colored curves are the unpredictable letter and the dark colored curves are the predictable letter. The dots are data and the lines are functions generated by samples from the posterior distribution. So the top row shows subjects that were rarely classified as learners by the model. You can see that the light and dark curves have the same shape and are generally flat. The bottom row shows subjects who were always classified as learners by the model. You can see that the onset of learning is very clear and that the second power function is really necessary to fit the data. These plots here show the 95% highest density interval for the posterior distributions of individual level parameters for all of the subjects who were reliably classified as learners by the model. Each dot is the median of the posterior for a particular individual, and the lines show the uncertainty in the posterior. And the colors here represent the different conditions. What I really want to highlight is that the amount of learning on the left and the rate of learning in the middle do not seem to systematically vary by condition. However, the onset of learning on the right does. People show evidence of learning earlier on in the experiment for the known words condition than the novel words or scrambled words. Notice also that the onset of learning is typically in the middle of the experiment and not at the beginning. So even though the model would allow learning to be at the very beginning, that just simply isn't what happened. This is important because it suggests that the learning process begins midway through the experiment, in contrast with some cognitive models that predict that learning will start immediately and proceed gradually. If we look at the posterior of the group level parameters, we can see this result very clearly. So on the left is the probability that an individual in each of the three conditions would be classified as a learner. Subjects in the known words condition are more likely to learn the patterns. In fact, the model estimates that subjects in the scrambled condition have only a 10 to 28% chance of learning the structure at all. So this is really interesting. And remember that subjects in all three conditions see the exact same NIW pattern. And this result indicates that the context that the pattern appears in matters quite a lot. 
And we reach the same conclusion if we look at the onset of learning on the right. So subjects in the known words condition learned the pattern relatively quickly, while subjects in the scrambled words condition took the longest, if they learned the pattern at all. All right, so to wrap things up, I want to think back to the original question, which was about the shape of the learning curve. We saw that learning in this experiment is really not gradual, but sh uh, showing this required a hierarchical model where we could look carefully at individual level data. And really the next step um, is gonna be to explore other experimental tasks like this one and see if we can find uh, similar patterns there.